Beta Cerba with us today, even though she is really in Florence, Italy. But with the miracles of technology, you can have somebody in two places at the same time. So Elisabetta Cerba is with us. She's a professor of pharmacology and director of the Center for Molecular Medicine at the University of Florence in Italy. And she was also the vice rector for scientific research of that university, which has a long tradition and a long history, of course, like the city of Florence. Elisabetta was a member of the Health Ministry Advisory Board. She chaired the European Working Group on Cardiac Cellular Electrophysiology. And she has done the work that I've known early on. And I see Dario Di Francesco here. So, uh, hi Dario. She uh, done some seminal work on the uh, hyperpolarization activated current IF and its regulation by the beta adrenergic cascade. More recently, she's done work on remodeling, both physiological remodeling, which is cardiac differentiation of stem cells, and also pathological remodeling. And that brings me to the topic of her lecture today, which is abnormalities in sodium current and calcium homeostasis as drivers of arrhythmogenesis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Elisabetta, the screen is yours and thank you for joining us today. So thank you very much, Yoram. Let, let me just mention one thing that I forgot to mention. If there are any questions, those who have questions, and I'm sure people will have questions, put, put, please put them in the chat box. And so at the end of the lecture, I will read them out of the chat box. And the, the other thing that you need to know is that this presentation is also being recorded for our own archive. Okay, I said everything. So th thank you, Joram, for, for your presentation. It, it's really a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. And uh, so to see also in a small screen, I see most, oh, so many friends. So I, I have to say that, uh, so I'm very glad uh, to have the possibility to meet you in this moment. Uh, we are a little bit alone, uh, each of us. So we are lucky from a certain point of view. Uh, so I start uh, sharing the screen and uh, start uh, with my presentation. Share, okay. Okay. So, uh, this is the title of my presentation. I have no conflict to disclose. And uh, uh, just I would like to start uh, showing the group that uh, uh, so uh, works in Florence, uh, and uh, also because uh, all the all the uh, experiments that I will report in my presentations come from uh, this beautiful group of people, and uh, so I'm grateful too. Uh, so the first point uh, that I would like to introduce uh, in my outline, this is my outline, is uh, uh, concerning the arrhythmogenic burden in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, uh, which is still a great big clinical problem. So this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as all you know, uh, is uh, a, the most common cardiomyopathy on a genetic base. Uh, it is a major cause of sudden death because the risk, the annual, the yearly risk is generally quite low is with respect to other cardiomyopathies between 0.5 and 1%. But the problem is that due to the large number of, uh, of, of patients uh, that uh, have the disease, uh, this is uh, quite a big problem. And some of these uh, people experience sudden death as uh, the first symptom, uh, the first event uh, due to ventricular arrhythmias uh, before knowing that they have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, there is also a progressive form of diastolic dysfunction that at uh, the late age or later on in, the, in these patients can cause uh, heart failure. So this is the natural history of, of the disease. So you see the stable phenotype in the most uh, likely situation. 
and adverse remodeling, as I said, uh, in a few percentage of cases uh, where people experience uh, heart failure. So there is a dilation of the left ventricle and the decrease of contraction. But most most cases, so the cardiac, the, the muscle is hyper contracting. And uh, there is a form that is an obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, where you have a great gradient or left ventricular out, uh, outflow, flow, um, outflow, uh, and uh, um, this is uh, th this big problem um, is something that I will talk about uh, in the in the next uh, in the next slides. So, what is uh, uh, how can we ide identify patients uh, at risk of arrhythmias? Uh, Arrhythmias is an event that can occur always, in any case, uh, in the uh, stable as well as in the uh, obstructive form, and it's not easy. Uh, for people that experience uh, early uh, sudden, uh, resuscitated the sudden uh, cardiac arrest or ventricular fibrillation, the indication is for an implantable cardio uh, defibrillator. Uh, in, in some cases, this is also indicated for other pe people, for other patients. But anyway, it's a, a difficult uh, clinical problem and also a difficult decision for the patient it itself because the quality of life changes dramatically. The other situation, the other possibility uh, is to, um, to uh, sorry, the other possibility is to, uh, treat with the uh, drugs, they, they are mostly symptomatic drugs, so they control symptoms, so they are very severe, especially in obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When I say se severe, it means that uh, uh, in these patients uh, you have uh, um, intolerance to exercise, uh, even moderate exercise, uh, people can do some exercise uh, because it's not, uh, so they, they can tolerate it, but they, um, they may have problems due to the enormous quantity of oxygen consumptions by these hearts. So the most, uh, um, the, 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 the drug that is most frequently used in these patients are beta blockers. And uh, uh, for the very severe forms, uh, they can use uh, disopyramide, and they can also use uh, undergoing to surgery and especially myectomy. So um, la last week when we had the beautiful seminar by Karin Sipido, you already, you have already seen that the problem in the heart, uh, in, in that case, in a heart failure, is the uh, formation of a scar um, due to fibrosis, in this case, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the fibrosis is diffuse. So you have not, uh, a, you, you cannot identify a, a, a precise uh, site of fibrosis. Sometimes you have patches of fibrosis, uh, sometimes it is an interstitial fibrosis. And uh, so, of course, uh, the structural remodeling is relevant in terms of arrhythmogenic risk. But we know, as we also heard last time, that uh, it's very likely that the arrhythmias, either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, starts from a premature beat uh, that uh, initiates uh, in a cardiomyocyte. And this is uh, the reason why we started to work on uh, human uh, cardiomyocytes. This is not a simple model. This is um, the, the most used models for hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Uh, of course, there are transgenic murine models. There are cardiomyocytes from uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells. I will not talk about that. I will talk a little bit about mouse models, but I will start on human cardiac samples. They have a great limitation, especially the scarce availability the genetic variability, each patient has a different profile. Even if in Italy, we, especially in Tuscany, we have some patients that have more or less the same kind of mutation. So 
Uh, by chance, uh, and this uh, the reason why we started uh, with uh, human cardiomyocytes, uh, we have an excellent center for cardiomyopathies that is now led by Jacopo Livotto and uh, uh, an outstanding cardiosurgery, which was initiated by Sir Magdi Jakub, who, who was one of our professors for a while, and now is carried out by Pierluigi Stefano. And uh, um, because surgical myectomy in this uh, in patients with obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should be performed by experienced operators. It's not an easily uh, surgical intervention that can be carried out. It consists in cutting a piece of septum that obstructs the flow from out from uh, the left ventricle. And we obtain these this, uh, fresh surgical samples that would be uh, otherwise uh, so uh, eliminated, so destroyed. And uh, you see these are the cells. This is a control cells. Control cells, of course, come from uh, patients undergoing corrective surgery, uh, for example, valve replacement, but not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, this is a, a cell that is enlarged by a patient with hypertro obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in these cells, we perform uh, electrophysiology and uh, uh, recordings of calcium current or calcium transients to uh, evaluate the uh, arrhythmogenic mechanism and calcium handling abnormalities, which are very likely the basis of uh, the arrhythmogenic risk and another feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is uh, diastolic dysfunction. So the, the, the heart of B, these patients have problems to relax in diastole. So uh, insights into the mechanism using the human cardiomyocyte model. This is our uh, old data, so I, I won't go into detail because uh, they were, were obtained. This was the first paper by Raffaele Coppini in uh, 2013, so already more than uh, seven years ago. And uh, you see that uh, the most important changes are a prolongation of action potential duration, uh, accompanied by alternance and the presence of early after depolarizations. At the same time, these cardiomyocytes have longer calcium transient, higher and longer calcium transient, accompanied by uh, the presence of uh, spontaneous releases of calcium and also delayed after depolarization. So at least the two or three arrhythmogenic mechanisms, including also actual potential prolongation are there. And if you stimulate these cardiomyocytes at high or at normal pricing, pacing rate, so this is one hertz, uh, one can observe this in dramatic increase in intracellular calcium and also uh, reported here. So what, he, what are the underlying mechanisms for these changes? So these are enlarged in the next slide. The prolongation of the action potential are mostly due to decrease of potassium currents, both transit outer current and a decrease in inward rectifying current. Also, the mRNA expression of these channels uh, is decreased, so it's also a transcriptional change uh, of expression. But uh, there are also changes in the polarizing currents, and especially the late sodium current. This current the sodium current uh, does not inactivate promptly, uh, giving rise to this uh, late current, uh, which causes a massive increase of sodium inside the cardiomyocytes. And the late sodium current, uh, so the L-type calcium current, uh, which is also increased. And this is uh, a difference, for example, with heart failure. In heart failure, you have not a an increase in calcium current. In most cases, almost also a decrease of calcium current. And instead, uh, the calcium current is increased and also the intracellular, the amount of calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum is preserved or even increased. So what is the mechanism? Uh, so we, um, one of the most uh, relevant mechanisms, there are many of course, uh, is an activation of calcium calmodulin kinase type 2, 
which can phosphorylate the sodium channel, giving uh, uh, so delaying the inactivation of the current. But this uh, enzyme can also phosphorylate a, a lot of other targets uh, or besides uh, phosphorylating itself, so out of phosphorylations, but also can phosphorylate phospholamine, phosphorylate the ionodine channels, can phosphorylate the calcium channels, uh, and so on. So uh, is uh, uh, the calcium calmodulin kinase is one of the mechanisms that cause uh, these uh, post-translational changes uh, in these uh, cells. And uh, um, it is activated by calmodulin and by intracellular calcium. So calcium overload due to sodium overload probably is a major cause of changes occurring in these cardiomyocytes. So uh, coming to pharma, a little bit of pharmacology, so you see here the response to isoproterenol in trabecule because uh, Cecilia Ferrantini is also able to cut and study the small trabecule from the, the uh, biopsies that we obtain. And you see that the response of beta to beta drainage stimulation is very well preserved in this trabecule. This is the contraction. The contraction is uh, slower. The um, relaxation especially is uh, slower in any case. But the response, also the lusitropic response to beta drainage stimulation is preserved. And this is, uh, uh, this is uh, particularly interesting also from, for its, uh, let's say, therapeutic implications. You see um, that, uh, um, for example, in other, in our failure, also the response to beta drainage stimulation is blunted. But this is not the case for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the consequences come, for example, uh, if you look at the electrophysiological effects. In fact, uh, in control conditions, as all we know, when you stimulate uh, beta adrenergic receptor, you have a shortening of the action potential duration. Instead, in uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the action potential duration, at least this is in, in isolated cardiomyocytes, is prolonged. So, of course, we are stimulating the cell at a constant rate. So if there is a prolongation of the action potential duration. And so you see here, the, um, the effect on the duration is just opposite. And this is due, among other mechanisms, to an increase of calcium current, which is the target of beta adrenergic stimulation. Why this difference? This difference, uh, now, I, um, so this difference, uh, I, I will, it, it's extremely uh, remarkable. And so it, I come to the next question is, uh, are, are these uh, changes that we observe suitable to predict, uh, or at least, at least to try to guess uh, the arrhythmogenic risk? So are this a basis of the arrhythmogenic risk in patients? Well, some, some examples that we have from clinical data here. In control patients, uh, when you, when this, when the, in control uh, subjects, uh, when they exercise, uh, you have a decrease of, uh, an increase of heart rate, a decrease of action potential duration, a decrease of QT. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if, the, if this patient exercise, you also get a decrease in action potential duration, an increase in heart rate, a decrease in QT. However, if you normalize the QT interval with respect to the heart rate, as we, we usually, the, the cardiologists do, um, and you look at uh, the changes in QT interval in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and in control. In control, during exercise, the QT interval either remain equal or shorten a little bit. While in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it increases. So it means that uh, these patients, uh, in these patients, uh, the adjustment uh, 
uh, to um, uh, of the actual potential duration of the QT interval in response to weak adrenergic stimulation is not normal. And this also uh, make, um, gives an explanation to the benefit of beta blockade in this patient. That's why so it is useful to use these drugs um, it also even at high dosage, dosage with variance or with um, heart failure in these patients. So this is another example. So this comes from a recent thesis uh, for, for a resident, Chiara Zocchi. And uh, uh, so this is uh, a um, retrospective study. So where, uh, so th th there was, a, 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 I think, a nice comparison between data obtained in the cardiomyocytes and uh, there were studies, uh, we isolated the study from myectomies of patients undergoing surgery and uh, the, uh, mm, the lifetime uh, um, evolution, the, 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 the lifetime um, uh, occurrence of uh, arrhythmias in patients, in the same patients that, that underwent uh, myectomy during uh, several months. So this uh, it was a retrospective study. And what we observe here that, uh, of course, in these patients, uh, in a certain number of cardiomyocytes, uh, we observed uh, uh, the occurrence of delayed after depolarizations. In some cells, uh, almost 40%, we observed the occurrence uh, of early after depolarization that are shown here. So we can stratify the cells uh, divided into cells of showing uh, abnormalities, cells don't showing abnormalities coming from the same patient. So here is uh, in overall in 61 patients, so we had cells from about 22 patients showing EAD, cells from 24% uh, of patients so showing DAD. So what is uh, the uh, what that did occur to this patient in time? So the patients uh, in the lifetime uh, follow-up of these patients, uh, some of them uh, had non-sustained ventricular tachycardia or other uh, arrhythmic events. And uh, so it was observed that uh, patient uh, whose cells had delayed after depolarizations have a higher probability to have uh, this kind of arrhythmias, severe arrhythmias in some cases. And uh, in fact, the, those patients whose cells have delayed after depolarization, you see that this Kaplan-Meier show that they go much worse than patients without delayed after depolarizations. So in some way, of course, this is a, a first study that was possible because of so many cells that were studied during these years, you see many months after the first experiment. It seems that the arrhythmogenic mechanism that we observe in these cells is somehow predictive of the evolution of the disease or the arrhythmogenic risk. Also, we cannot forget that uh, there are other mechanisms that are uh, underlying, uh, such as fibrosis, but uh, we have not enough data at the moment. So can we target uh, these modified channels and calcium homeostasis besides beta blockers? Because of course we do. So the data come from two, the data of the lab come from two drugs, Ranolazin and isopyramide. Uh, I want uh, so just a few a few words about ranolazin. So uh, these two drugs uh, blocks both blocks late sodium current. Uh, there are some differences anyway because uh, uh, ranolazin is much more selective for the late sodium current with respect to the peak sodium current, and also it shows a little bit more selectivity versus toward late sodium current with respect to potassium current. Disopyramide uh, is a drug that has, has been and is also now 
very much used to treat patients, especially patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But his selectivity is quite low, both uh, selectivity, uh, the ratio between uh, the effect on late and, and the peak sodium current, and also the selectivity toward potassium current. Uh, despite this low selectivity, uh, both the, the drug disopiramid is much more used than ranolazine in these patients. So uh, this all uh, these um, first experiments that were done uh, seven years ago showed very, uh, very clearly that ranolazine, when it blocks the late sodium current, can also reduce action potential duration, can also abrogate the early after depolarizations and also, even if it's not shown, delayed after depolarization. So we know that since years, uh, the blo blo uh, blockade of the late sodium current is effective in reducing the, in targeting the arrhythmogenic mechanism. However, as I told you, uh, the uh, disopyramide is, uh, is more used than ranolazine, is uh, a, a common drug in these patients. It's used uh, in, uh, alone with, or with beta blockers uh, in almost let's say half of the patients. This is uh, the court from Florence uh, in 250 patients. Now probably there are more than that. Uh, what is the problem uh, for, for this drug? The problem is that it prolongs uh, the QT interval because it targets uh, the uh, IKR. So, uh, and uh, this may represent a risk, an arrhythmogenic risk. We know that all antiarrhythmic drugs uh, uh, have some arrhythmogenic risk, but of course, uh, in patients uh, with that has already an arrhythmogenic risk, so using uh, such a drug is not uh, ideal for many cardiologists. As I told you, disopyramide has multiple targets. It blocks the peak sodium current, it blocks the late sodium current, uh, it reduces uh, the amount of sparks, so the release of calcium inside the cardiomyocytes. These cardiomyocytes from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they have spontaneous release of calcium very frequently. So um, it reduces twitch tension, and that's why it is used in these patients. The advantage uh, with respect to other drugs, for sure with respect to ranolazine, it, it, it is a specific negative inotropic effect. And uh, um, because of this, uh, that can be demonstrated in trabecule, but can, it also can be demonstrated in, um, in patients, you have a decrease of uh, left ventricular outflow tract gradient uh, that improve the resistance, the tolerance, for example, to exercise in these patients. And uh, it also reduces intracellular calcium and it decreases action potential duration. And this was, let's say, quite a surprise from a certain point of view because it blocks a uh, uh, potassium current, we know, but it decreases, uh, it shortens the action potential duration. And in fact, also in this clinical data was provided by Mike Sherid, uh, the reduce of, so the, the changes in QT interval were not, the QT interval were not significantly prolonged. Of course, it blocks the late sodium current. So what is the explanation? we think. The explanation is that in hypertrophic cardiomyocytes, disopyramide targets specifically the late sodium current, which is increased, the calcium current, which is increased. Of course, it targets also the potassium current, but this is very small in these cardiomyocytes. However, disopyramide in controlled cells blocks uh, uh, mostly the potassium current, much less uh, sodium and calcium, or at least uh, they have less weight uh, in action potential duration. So disopyramide prolongs APD and QT interval in, in healthy cardiomyocytes. But luckily enough, uh, it doesn't do that uh, 
in hypertrophic cardiomyocytes. And this is a simulation that was uh, obtained thanks to collaboration with uh, Alfonso Bueno Rovio. And uh, you see that uh, if you can uh, simulate that uh, the effect of uh, um, the, the changes, the decrease in action potential duration in cardiomyocytes is uh, uh, much larger uh, for those myocytes that have a longer action potential duration. And with this simulation gives the idea that in uh, endomyocardium and in the septum especially, the use of disoparamide does not increase QT dispersion, but especially particularly decrease the QT dispersion due to the effect on action potential duration. So it acts more in the, where the action potential duration is longer. And this is uh, due especially to its effect on the late sodium current. So I come to the, to the last part of my talk. Can all the new therapies switch off triggers and revert remodeling? So one thing that we should say at this point is that uh, um, the um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a, a, a particular disease. The cardiomyocytes, as I show you, are very healthy and uh, the, 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 the heart is hypercontracting. Um, so the problem is that uh, during the time you have a remodeling that, all, that is a remodeling of the cardiomyocytes, but also a remodeling of, of non-cardiac uh, uh, cardiomyocyte, myocyte, myocytic cells uh, like myofibroblast and so on, and also microvasculature and, and, and so on. And so the question is, can we stop this remodeling? So of course you can't do that in, in um, isolated cardiomyocytes from the human heart. So uh, we selected this uh, mouse model. Uh, this is a mouse model uh, that has a, 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 gene, a, a, a gene variant at the level of the troponin T. And this particular interest that was provided by Jill Cardiff because these mice have fibrosis, hypertrophy, of course, diastolic dysfunction and arrhythmia. So they have all the features of the human hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so they have, uh, when we, um, these mice have a, a very pronounced late sodium current. So uh, the, the, when they are adult, so they show the, the late sodium current uh, at the six, six months of age. However, if we want to prevent uh, uh, the effect of remodeling, uh, it's clear that we should start the treatment earlier. Also because uh, the increase in late sodium current is very, of course, very early. You see, this is uh, at one month, uh, they have already an increased late sodium current. Of course, uh, this uh, cannot, probably does not occur in humans, but uh, at uh, the, you know, we know that uh, the lifespan of, of mice is much shorter. So what we had to do is to treat, uh, uh, try to treat these mice lifelong. There are four groups of mice, uh, a, a group of control uh, mice, group of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mice, and uh, uh, they were treated or not treated, not treated with, or treated with ranolazine. So some of the mice were treated with uh, vehicle and some of the mice were treated with ranolazine. And the first observation that we got is after long treatment for 12 months, so a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, so the, the, while the, 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 the hearts of uh, the transgenic of the mutant mice uh, showing, showed a very pronounced hypertrophy at the echo, at the Doppler. Um, those treated with ranolazine have almost uh, oh, very reduced hypertrophy. You see here, there was a significant uh, improvement. So it seems that uh, a sort of reverse remodeling or prevention of remodeling occurred in these mice. 
We don't know if reverse modeling occurs, but so at least it was prevented. And uh, um, while the uh, mice, the, the, the cardiomyocytes from mice that were not treated, they had this uh, spontaneous uh, uh, arrhythmias delayed after the polarizations. In the mouse uh, treated, we didn't observe spontaneous uh, arrhythmias uh, in, in also in the presence of, of isoproterenol. So the rate of arrhythmic events was very much reduced in these mice. And also the uh, amount of uh, fibrosis uh, was very much reduced. So it seems that ranolazine treatment, long li lifelong ranolazine treatment prevents the arrhythmic burden. And, and this is an interesting observation, but no, no one could think to treat uh, a, a a child lifelong with ranolazine, of course. So it's an, an interesting observation. The main problem and another problem is that uh, the primary sarcomeric uh, um, uh, defect was not changed. This can be measured by uh, the group of Corrado JC, who is able to measure the, the, two, the, the force uh, in um, the small uh, uh, myofibrils uh, isolated from uh, the, the heart of these mice. And you see that uh, calcium sensitivity, which is a, a consequence of the defect, uh, is uh, very much increased uh, in uh, myofibrils from uh, um, mutant mice, but is not changed by ranolazine because the defect is still there. So what is next? The, the last part uh, is uh, that no, not all the changes uh, are limited uh, to channels. There are other cha changes uh, that uh, can be taken into consideration. And uh, some of the study were performed in where I'm sitting now, in the lens is the laboratory, European Laboratory on Nonlinear Spectroscopy. They have beautiful, beautiful laser uh, systems, but um, so uh, luckily enough, they are also uh, like to apply their systems, not only to atoms, but also to um, biological systems. And uh, this is uh, the hypothesis that come from uh, a long series of, of, of experiments that were led by Leonardo Sacconi together with Claudia Cucini and Cecilia Ferrantini. They, show, they suppose that uh, in several conditions in cardiomyocytes, the T tubules are remodeled. We know from the lab the work of several groups uh, that did the course. And uh, uh, this remodeling caused the, um, the stop, the, the block of uh, transmission of uh, uh, um, the electrical conductance of the T tubule. Uh, so that they not, do not conduct the action potential. And this is uh, uh, somehow uh, a big problem. Why is a big problem? It's a big problem, you see here, uh, because when you uh, do not have the propagation of the action potential from this sarcolemma to the internal core of the cardiomyocytes, the increase of calcium is, is much slower inside the cardiomyocytes. These are measurements taken from the cardiomyocytes from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, patients. And you see that this delay in the cell core of these cardiomyocytes, and this was due also to the disappearance, almost disappearance of transverse T tubules. You see here, these tubules are not even uh, visible. So um, this is also demonstrated by another nice thing, I think for an electrophysiologist, that we, if we compare the ratio between cell capacitance and volume, um, the ratio is much uh, higher. So they have in control cells, so they have more membrane than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the disappearance of this membrane, let's, so, uh, let's say, is likely due to the uh, loss of T tubules. The same defect uh, can be observed in uh, mouse models. I cannot go into detail, but it, you can see here 
uh, this is something that was not uh, done yet uh, in human cardiomyocytes, uh, that in, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mice, uh, there is not only um, so a decrease of the number of T tubules, uh, there is also a, an increase of axial T tubules, of longitudinal T tubules instead of uh, transversal T tubules. And so there is a complete remodeling of T tubules. Uh, and also, uh, you see that uh, in some of these T tubules, uh, action potential is not propagated. Uh, this was possible because of the application of a te particular technique, a ramp technique, uh, that allow for measuring uh, both action potential and uh, calcium transient in T tubules and uh, at the sarcolemma at the same time. So, but as I told you, uh, the primary sarcomeric alteration is not changed. It's not changed. That means that uh, these patients uh, probably can, the arrhythmogenic burden can be reduced, but they are not cured. So, uh, uh, what, 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 what is next? What is next? Next is uh, something that is very new, uh, was not uh, performed in our laboratory, also if uh, Jacopo Olivotto uh, was part of this important clinical trial with Mavacamten. Mavacamten is a new small drug that uh, reduces uh, the uh, number of engaged so-called myosin acting cross bridges. And uh, doing that, uh, it decreases uh, the force of contraction and the oxygen consumption of uh, the heart. So it targets specifically the cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, this is, um, was due uh, mostly to the beautiful work of uh, Sideman, of uh, the two Sideman. And uh, uh, this is uh, a, a probably the, the most important uh, novelty for this kind of disease. The results of the phase three trial were presented uh, at the European, um, uh, European Cardiology Congress uh, in um, Society of Cardiology Congress uh, last August by Jacopo Livotto. And uh, so all the results were very uh, promising. So these patients uh, uh, met the first, uh, the primary endpoint concerning uh, uh, the decrease in oxygen consumption, uh, the um, amelioration, so the improvement of the uh, um, New York uh, um, of a, a, N, NYHA class improvement uh, and so on. So this, the treatment of patients with this new drug uh, seems uh, um, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient with obstruction uh, seems very, very promising. Um, there are some studies that are carried out in the lab of Corrado Poggesi in this moment because they have the possibility to measure directly which are the effect on mabacamptin on myofibrils from the human hearts to see the kinetics and the effect of the kinetics. And they are giving interesting results that were presented at the biophysical meeting last uh, in February. And of course, uh, so uh, we are expecting for definitive, definite data. We tried, these are unpublished data, we tried to do the same in cardiomyocytes just to try to answer a question that was arising during the presentation is, what is the anti, does this drug has an antiarrhythmic effect? Uh, of course, uh, we, we can't say during acute, uh, uh, acute uh, uh, treatment with this drug, but you can see that at least it doesn't do anything on action potential. It doesn't do anything on, uh, on a calcium transit of these cardiomyocytes and uh, However, so this is a contraction of the cardiomyocyte that is stimulated. This is the calcium transient. See that is contracting. And uh, so if we go to the next slide. So here, here is the calcium transient after treatment with mavacantin. The calcium transient is still there. But if we stimulate the cardiomyocytes, it does not contract very well. And that's why probably the effect of Mavacamptin that reduces uh, 
the cross bridge uh, engaged in this cardiomyocytes. So last message, arrhythmias in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients still represent a clinical burden, we know. Is the human cardiomyocyte model suitable to predict the rhythmic risk? Yes, but of course it must be combined with other models uh, allowing for uh, stratification and approaches such as uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells that I didn't show, genetic and epigenetic. Can we target altered ion channels and calcium homeostasis? Yes, especially for symptoms. But of course, uh, the, the uh, remodeling, the prevention of remodeling is another story. And uh, can we, can therefore all the new therapies switch off these triggers and revert remodeling? Maybe yes. Maybe, but the dependence on genotype, uh, for example, in case of Mavacamptin, and efficacy against arrhythmias, uh, indeed deserve more clinical studies and also more preclinical studies. And I would like to finish, uh, so mentioning the people that mostly contributed to, to this work, uh, and uh, also um, the grants uh, that provided us uh, with the uh, support to perform these experiments uh, and uh, again all of you for, uh, uh, for, for this opportunity to present uh, our data. Thank you very much. Thank you Elisabetta for a real, really fantastic, maybe you can um, unshare your screen for now. Yes. That's better. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. It was really a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you for sharing with us some wonderful and beautiful data uh, that you have from different levels. Before I start reading uh, questions from others, I have one more qu one question of my own. Uh, and it has to do with uh, gap junctions. Do you know anything about um, gap junctions in this particular disease? No. Different from the post-MI where you have a concentrated scar. This is infiltrated and it's uniform. And I don't know if there is there are any data on gap junction and coupling in this setting. Yeah. No, this is a, no, this is a very good question, but we have no data. The, the problem, you know, is that uh, there is something that uh, um, we, we would like, but we had not the possibility, so to have uh, cardiac slices, yes. cardiac slices. Yes, yes. and uh, we plan to do that, uh, but of course uh, it's, um, um, it's challenging. Uh, I know that Cesare Terracciano uh, has performed some, 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 some very good uh, work on this side, but um, we are not able. Uh, I know also that Karin Sipido uh, probably is going to at least, not, perhaps not in this model, not in, in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but I guess that if we don't have uh, um, this model, it's, it's, it's not easy to answer your question. Yeah, but it could be very important for arrhythmogenesis. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me open my checkbox. And I'll start looking at the questions. Hold on one second. Okay, from our first question from Jinny Tseng. How about IKS channel expression, KCNQ1 and KCNE1 proteins and function of in HCM? I think the mRNA of KCNQ1 is reduced but do not remember whether there was KCNE one mRNA measurement. So, um, um, so I, you mentioned the the um, IKR or uh, IKS. IKS. So it was reduced. All, all the potassium channels were reduced, both at, at transcriptional and. Uh, um, protein level, so all, all of them. Um, oh, we, we have no uh, 
recordings uh, of specific currents. So we have only recordings of uh, um, a transient outer current and uh, um, inner rectifying current. We didn't, it, it is uh, challenging to measure these currents uh, in the isolated cardiomyocytes from the human isolated cardiomyocytes, I mean. So, so we, we know from, uh, so we guess they're reduced. Also because, uh, um, uh, so the effect of uh, beta adrenergic stimulation, because of the effect of beta adrenergic stimulation, know that uh, uh, especially AKS uh, is a target, a specific uh, target of beta adrenergic stimulation. So if it was there, we should expect uh, a, a big um, a reduction of action potential duration, but this does not occur. So we guess that uh, uh, also the, the, from a functional point of view, the current uh, is not very much expressed. Well, as, as you say, the IKS increases five folds under beta adrenergic stimulation. Yeah. And it's mostly important in rate dependent adaptation of APD. So you need to really go through rate, you know, different rates to see if it's adapting uh, yes. um, functionally. Let me see. The next question is from Leon Glass from uh, Montreal. Do the number of PVCs or their characteristics have any predictive value for serious arrhythmias? Um, so, um, I'm not sure the, the number of, of um, oh, I, yes, you need from a clinical point of view. What is the question? Yes. The question, yeah. Yeah, you can take it on. Yes, from the clinical point of view, from, uh, from recordings of patients that have HCM, do they also have PVCs and are there fixed coupling interval, variable coupling interval? Do those have any predictive value of serious arrhythmia? Yeah. Yes. I mean, um, yes, this is a, so uh, they, well, it, it's not easy. So it's not easy to, to answer these questions, especially, so I'm not a cardiologist myself. Uh, so, uh, but what we know is that uh, any, uh, any attempt to stratify patients, uh, depending, that is relevant uh, also for any decision concerning the implantation of a defibrillator to stratify patients uh, depending on uh, um, the presence of uh, um, uh, premature beats or also even ventricular tachycardia is not uh, uh, so successful. So what we know uh, at the best of our knowledge uh, at this moment, uh, we know that uh, uh, people that uh, experience uh, um, um, so cardiac arrest, uh, um, so that is a, a clear indication of a rhythmogenic risk. For all the other um, subjects, uh, the, um, so even the occurrence of arrhythmias, but this also the, can be the case uh, in, uh, in other uh, types of cardiomyopathies, uh, is not sufficient to take the decision to implant a defibrillator. Okay, thank you. Okay, now from uh, Jonathan Moreno. There is a lot of fascinating preclinical data on the late sodium current. Yet the late sodium current hypothesis did not yet seem to pan out in the small clinical trials. He names them Liberty, Restyle. What are your thoughts on this discrepancy? Yeah. So this is um, this is an history that uh, we should we should need another another some some more time to discuss. So um, of course it's not true that it didn't give any result. So there was some interesting results, um, uh, for example, concerning uh, in particular the tolerance uh, to, um, to uh, the resistance to, to exercise, for example. Um, there, there was also, a, a, let's say, a, an indication of an antiarrhythmic effect 
in a sub, some subgroup of patients, the problem uh, was that probably um, they chose the selection of patients. So this is the interpretation. So a general interpretation was not optimal. So uh, of course, uh, when um, the study with Ma Mavacampton were, uh, were initiated, uh, of course, uh, these studies uh, also took advantage uh, of uh, the errors in the previous studies. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, we can't say that uh, uh, was a complete failure. So it didn't, it, it is true that it didn't meet the primary uh, outcome, the primary endpoint, uh, but also uh, it is remarkable that these patients were, the selection of these patients was not ideal to demonstrate uh, the effect. Uh, prob probably these patients uh, were, had a very severe stage and they were not ideal for this reason. So um, in, in, in the choice of uh, the selection of patients should have been uh, probably started as an early stages uh, with no so severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy obstruction. And uh, so it is possible, but of course, uh, this is uh, my thought, as you said, it's not, uh, I can't say, but if we, uh, look carefully to data, it is true that uh, some effect uh, on, a, on the tolerance of, to exercise and also uh, the um, amount of uh, uh, arrhythmic uh, or premature um, um, beats and uh, arrhythm arrhythmic events uh, were reduced. So that, that is, um, so it was a pity that uh, probably the design of the study was not optimal. So the second study, there was another, you know, an attempt of the study with the eleclazine, the other, uh, um, so the, 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 the other derivative, but it's also very selective against the delayed sodium current. Uh, but um, in that case, um, you know, the, the, the study was stopped uh, prematurely because of some um, events uh, that uh, were hardly can be attributed to the, to the, to the drug. But in that case, uh, there were not only, so they were not hypertrophic patients, they were patients with heart failure. So it's a different story. Sure, could I just add on, uh, and I completely agree with everything you said. Could I just add one add on question? Is anyone doing any primary prevention studies with renolazine? I think you kind of alluded to that in your talk. So primary prevention, the problem is that the primary prevention, if you look at the data on mice, when should you start with primary prevention? So, and especially, uh, I don't know if, um, um, so at this point, uh, so something that could be proposed probably um, uh, before Mavacampton, but I doubt at this point uh, that uh, if uh, uh, something uh, is proposed in a, as a clinical study um, is not Mavacampton. So at least this is, uh, I mean, from a pharmacological point of view, from a clinical point of view, if you have one drug that is uh, uh, so you have beta blockers, you have calcium channel blockers, uh, and also ranolazine that uh, uh, target uh, the uh, probably mostly the remodeling. And you have a drug that target the cause of the disease. You probably start uh, with, with the last one for a, a study to prevent uh, the appearance of the most severe form of the disease. Of course, uh, um, so I, I think that at least my impression is that uh, at this time uh, it would be hard to propose any other clinical study with ranolazine. But so this is uh, what I think. Okay, uh, next question. Another question from Jeannie Tsang. Junctophilin 2 mutations have been associated with human HCM. <clears throat> Have the investigators looked into JPH2 expression and distribution? 
And then she adds wonderful presentation, outstanding data. So what is the question? Let me read it again. The question is, junk to feeling two mutation have been associated with human HCM. Yes. Have you looked at JPH2 expression and distribution? No. No, 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 no. Okay, I, I guess the question. I, I thought it was a, a, a sentence with no question. No, we, we did not. We did not yet. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, I forget to say that uh, I didn't show the slide that uh, a lot of mutations are associated. Probably there was one of the last slide has been associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are many uh, different genetic causes uh, that can uh, give as the result uh, and uh, this is one of that. Um, so uh, our patient uh, has mostly, I didn't show the, the um, most of the, of the patients has uh, um, protein bind, uh, um, myosin binding, uh, protein C uh, mutations. They have myosin uh, heavy chain mutations. So, and also they, they have, uh, um, so this, this was troponin T, troponin E mutation, troponin I mutation. So um, this is uh, the subset of the patients that we had. Uh, of course, uh, the problem is that we are studying, um, we are studying mostly for the human uh, experiments, uh, myectomies uh, from patients that develop severe disease uh, that come to Florence. So, of course, uh, I'm sure that it would be very nice to have other patients, but uh, it is quite, uh, um, quite. Uh, I mean, um, unlikely, I think, that uh, we can have uh, samples from uh, biopsies from a patient uh, with a rare disease, a more, a more uh, frequent disease that come to Florence. So this is, uh, of course, uh, at least for the human studies, it would be interesting, but mostly impossible, I think. Of course, there are beautiful, beautiful mouse models for many different types of disease and IPS studies. We have now some IPS models from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially the most frequent one, a genetic defect that can be um, found in Tuscany, but um, this is related uh, to myosin, to, to the myosin protein, to the myosin heavy chain, not to, to, uh, to other um, proteins. So I know, so it, it's, it's a limited subset of studies, of course, uh, the one that we have experienced too. Okay, the next question is from uh, Carol Ann Remer from Amsterdam. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Elisabetta. Apart from blocking late sodium current, renolazine also has metabolic effects. For instance, fatty acid oxygenation, oxidation. Do you think this is also contributing to its beneficial effects? Yes, hi, Caroline. Uh, uh, well, uh, so it has, uh, we know, so it was probably developed for those effects, ranolazine. Um, so it is possible. What we, um, uh, we, we don't have um, metabolic experiments in this mice. Uh, of course, uh, uh, so th this is an interesting point. Uh, we can we, we cannot exclude that some of uh, the beneficial effects are also due to, to metabolic uh, effects. But also, um, if I remember correctly, some of these effects uh, also a beta blocking effect uh, is also reported for ranolazine. Of course, uh, quite um, high concentration, and so. I guess that at least in our mice, um, looking at the, the plasma, the blood con plasmatic concentration of this drug that was measured at any age, uh, most of the effect uh, was due to um, sodium 
late sodium current blockade more than other current blockade or metabolic effect uh, blockade or beta adrenergic blockade, beta adrenergic receptor blockade. So, uh, but of course, on, on a long term uh, course, uh, uh, so it, it is possible, but the acute effect, uh, no. It's better. Okay. <laughs> next, uh, next question is not too far from you, Elisabetta. It's Dario Di Francesco in Milan. Hi, Dario. Dario is saying, Grazie, Elisabetta. Great talk. It looks this is more a mechanical than an electrical disease. Has there been any genome-wide screening study to identify a whole set of mutations? Uh, well, um, yes, th there are a lot of studies that have been performed on uh, on the human uh, on the human uh, samples. Not not by us, I have to say. We are not very good in, gen in genomic studies at this moment. Uh, but uh, this, this was something that was always planned. But you know, Dario, the problem is that uh, the, this, these studies are quite expensive. So it's, uh, you, you have to, so we proposed in several grants, but we did not succeed. And uh, um, so we, we based our knowledge on other uh, beautiful experiments that have been done. For sure, there are a lot of targets that are changed. Um, for example, uh, uh, the our, our channel. Can I say our channel, HCN channel? <laughs> sure. It's, yes. It's not, it's not changed. It's not changed. So it's not uh, increased. Let's say it's not increased. So that is uh, one form of one type of hypertrophy where the IF is not uh, hyper expressed. Uh, that was uh, one of the few. Uh, things that I tried, but with no success. And um, uh, so it is possible that if we look, uh, so as it has been in mice, if we look at uh, uh, targets, a lot of targets, also metabolic targets, uh, as uh, Carlan says, said, uh, these are very much changed. But um, the problem is that uh, we cannot talk about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so there are a lot of different cardiomyopathies. So if uh, uh, we look, depending on the genetic defect, uh, uh, there are, uh, so especially in human beings, uh, so there are so many different uh, one from another one that you should select uh, one mutation probably that what we proposed uh, to choose one family, one family, one mutation, and look for genetic and epigenetic in that mutation, because otherwise you have so many confounding factors in these patients. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from uh, Livia Hull. Livia is in Perth, Australia. So we're having several continents presenting. Um, thank you for a beautiful talk. Where you show increases in late sodium current and calcium current with isoproternal in human tissue. What were the HCM mutations expressed in the human tissue you studied? What is uh, the... Um... Can, can you, pardon, can, can you repeat? I, I'm not sure that I catch the, the exactly equation. I'll well, read the is... question again. Where, uh, or Olivia, do you want to read the question? Hi, Joram. Thanks. Thank Hi, you for asking. Why don't you communicate directly with Elisabetta? Sure. Hi. Thank you so much. Beautiful talk and lovely data. Um, yes, I was just asking, you showed some increases in late sodium current and calcium current with isoproterenol with beta adrenergic receptor stimulation. So what I was asking, and that was from human tissue, that was, yes. I think, from the myectomy tissue. Yes. So can you tell me what the mutations were in those patients specifically? Ah, I, I don't know. Yes, I have to check. I, I don't know. It is probably was a... a 
uh, protein C mutations, but I don't know. I should uh, so uh, I, I I I can't say so. Um, most of our patients have uh, myosin heavy chain or, 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 my, or protein C mutations, but I don't know uh, exactly what is. But there was a, I have, I have to say, we didn't see what, what, this is something that I can say. We didn't see many differences uh, in terms of uh, electrophysiological remodeling or response to beta adrenergic stimulation or response to ranolazine depending on um, depending on the genetic defect so it seems uh, it seems uh, at least in our hands but of course you have to consider that uh, this is a limited subset of patients uh, undergoing myectomies it yes. seems that once you have this severe um, progression toward obstruction that is much more frequent, especially for some types of, uh, um, of uh, ge uh, genotype. For, for example, um, for troponin T mutations, um, I, I even do not remember, for probably Raffaele remember that you, if we have patients, but these patients have a, a dramatic high risk uh, of arrhythmias and sometimes a very, very light remodeling. So the problem is that, uh, so in the subset of patients with obstruction and mostly they have, um, um, so a, a defect in terms of uh, uh, myosin or, um, or uh, protein C, binding protein C is, uh, um, so the, we, we couldn't find any difference uh, in terms of uh, electrophysiological remodeling, uh, expression of uh, uh, post-translational modification in terms of uh, response to ducts. We would like to see that, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You're okay, welcome. We have uh, the last two questions from Sandor Kovac. Shandor is a professor of cardiology here and a cardiologist, and he's saying, wonderful, thank you. Given that the duration of mechanical systole is the QT interval, in cases when QT is prolonged in response to medicines, is mechanical duration of systole also prolonged? After all, the purpose of myocytes is to contract and pump. So that's question number one. And question number two, is detubulation reversible? Huh. So, so um, for the first question, yes, of course, we, we um, I mean, uh, um, contraction ca cannot be measured accurately in, in cardiomyocytes, can be measured in, in trabeculae. And of course, uh, uh, so you 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 action potential duration is prolonged, and uh, systole is prolonged. You see, perhaps you remember that uh, uh, slide showing uh, the contraction of trabeculae, and was evident uh, that uh, the twitch was prolonged. So th that's true, and uh, of course uh, this is uh, these patients uh, experience uh, a problem in relaxation. They have diastolic dysfunction. They have no, the, the diastol, diastolic period is uh, short and uh, due to the increase in intracellular calcium, you have also a hypercontractility during diastole. So the, the myocardium that does not relax uh, um, completely. Uh, and this is uh, so one of, of the causes, of course, uh, not the only one of uh, mm, um, the um, gradient, uh, the increase of the gradient uh, of the left ventricular outflow tract, uh, that is uh, one of the reasons why they undergo myectomy. So, uh, so this is uh, um, can be can be observed also in um, ex excised tissue. Not only, of course, a clinical problem, but also our tissue has the same uh, defect. 
coming to Trabecule, we, we, mm, so the, the problem is that, um, uh, so yes and no. <laughs> yes, because uh, um, I, I didn't show, but uh, cardiomyocytes from, uh, um, from uh, mice that were treated with ranolazine um, since uh, lifelong, they uh, have normal tubules. So at least when you prevent a lot of things, when you prevent hypertrophy, you prevent uh, fibrosis and everything, you also prevent uh, T-tubules uh, um, degeneration or T-tubules modifications. Um, it is, it is much more difficult to demonstrate that uh, in, in vitro, for example, for the simple reason that uh, we should uh, um, keep the myocytes in conditions that they do not lose the tubules. And this is not easy because when you put my, the cardiomyces in, in culture, they spontaneously uh, lost the tubules. There is a, a possibility that we didn't try yet. We didn't do that uh, because uh, the, it's a very beginning, the model, is to use um, cardiomyocytes from IPS. So the experiment should be, you get cardiomyocytes uh, in optimal conditions so, so they become prolonged. They also develop the tubules. And uh, uh, you could see whether there is a difference in uh, uh, the formation of T-tubules. Uh, and in case if you can restore T-tubules uh, in uh, cells from uh, uh, IPS coming from patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very complicated situation, a very complicated experiments. Otherwise, I don't know how to demonstrate uh, at least in this model. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, uh, so it's, um, it's something that, um, so I, 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 I really don't know how I, I could manage uh, the experiment acutely uh, in this cardiomyocytes. They lose uh, mm -hmm. uh, T-tubules very easily. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of uh, this uh, wonderful seminar. Thank you again, uh, Elisabetta, for sharing with us your beautiful work. And to everybody, uh, first of all, we're going on a break now until the spring semester. So this is in between semesters and um, the first seminar in the spring will be on February 9th, 9th of February, and it will be Jonathan Lederer. And John uh, promised me to tell you everything he knows about the mitochondria. So that's from John Lederer. And uh, everybody else, uh, happy holidays and please uh, stay safe. And I think that uh, Elisabetta and Jonathan uh, Moreno and Raffaele are staying on, right? And Jean. For a discussion. So I will depart.